Who was Nicholas Pusa? Nicolas Poussa, 1594-1665, was a French painter who spent a great deal of time studying and working in Rome. Where he was greatly inspired by the Roman ruins he saw there. Poussa was an intellectual artist who was favored by similarly minded patrons. He is known for his sophisticated subjects inspired by philosophy, ancient history, and the Old Testament. His fascinating painting, Dance to the Music of Time, c. 1638-1640, is full of complex symbolism. In the center of the painting, four maidens, or possibly three maidens and one male. Wearing Roman clothing hold hands and dance in a circle to the beat of the lyre. Played by a winged and bearded personification of time. Tiny cherubs play around their feet. One blows bubbles while the other holds an hourglass, symbols of the fragile and fleeting nature of life. Next to the dancers is a tall sculpture depicting the two-headed Roman god, Janus. Whose faces can see both into the future and into the past. In the sky above, Aurora. The dawn, leads Apollo, whose chariot arcs across the sky, bringing with it the sun. The painting draws heavily on classical figures and has a stoic. Serious tone closely associated with classical art. The dancers are thought to be personifications of both the four seasons. As well as representations of human progress specifically poverty, labor, wealth, and luxury. Although the painting has been interpreted in many ways. It is perhaps a representation not just of the fragility of life, but the impermanence of all civilization. Why is the tiny Tempietto an important example of high Renaissance architecture? The Tempieto is a small, circular church, officially called the Church of San Pietro in Monte Orio, Rome. It was designed around 1502 by Donato Bramante. A famed architect from Urbino who was later hired to design St. Peter's Cathedral. Tempieto means Little temple and its style is reminiscent of an ancient pagan temple. It was built over what is believed to be the site of St. Peter's crucifixion and housed relics associated with the Apostle. Bramante's design was very much in tune with classical. Aesthetics popular during the Renaissance, especially in Italy. The architectural elements are mathematically proportioned and the overall style is unified. Making the building almost like a work of sculpture. The simplicity of the exterior, along with the use of classical columns, a dome. And hemispherical entablature, inspired many other building projects in Rome. Though small, the Tempieto is one of the most significant. Examples of High Renaissance Architecture in Italy What is the ecstasy of St. Teresa?
The Ecstasy of St. Teresa is a central sculpture in the Cornero Chapel in the Church of Santa Maria della Vittoria in Rome. It is considered to be a masterpiece of Baroque sculpture and was made by Gian Lorenzo Bernini between 1645 and 1652. The sculpture depicts Saint Teresa of Avila, who in life experienced powerful visions. In her writing, Saint Teresa describes an encounter with an angel who stabbed her in the 138 heart with a golden spear. She believed the experience was an encounter with God. Bernini's complex sculpture, which dominates the chapel space, depicts this vision. Within an elevated niche, Saint Teresa seems to float amidst her undulating robes. Her toes peek out from underneath the mass of fabric. Curling in a combination of pain and pleasure during this divine encounter. Her mouth is open and her head tilts back as a small angel gingerly grasps at her clothes with one hand and grips a golden spear in the other, the spear points directly at her breast. The figures appear to float because they are supported by a hidden candle evered mass of marble. Mirroring the spear, bronze beams of light descend upon the pair from above. Helping to frame the scene from within the niche and emphasize the presence of the divine. In other parts of the chapel, marble bystanders watch from theater boxes, in awe. The sculpture is like a frozen theater piece. It is a highly illusionistic depiction of the pleasure and pain of Saint Teresa. And a surprisingly sensual representation of the divine. Why did Veronese get into so much trouble? Veronese, 1528-1588, was the nickname of Paolo Colliari. A painter from Verona who made his career in Venice during the second half of the 16th century. Many of his paintings celebrate the ornate architecture of the city and the well-heeled lives of its nobility. His seemingly harmless painting, Feast in the House of Levi, however, got him into trouble with the Catholic Inquisition. The painting was originally called The Last Supper, with Christ depicted in the center of a large Ornate hall, dining with a rather rambunctious crowd. The enormous painting, which is 18 feet tall and 42 feet long, included images of drunkards, a man with a bloody nose, cats, dogs, parrots, dwarves, and Germans all of which the Inquisition found unacceptable in a painting of such a holy scene. Levi is surprised at this and seems to question Christ with a gesture that indicates, Who, me? Christ is calling Levi, who will become Saint Matthew, to a life of faith rather than sin. Like other work by Caravaggio, the calling of Saint Matthew was shocking and popular for its realism and for its juxtaposition of Roman street life with divine, holy figures. One does not usually see Christ walk into a bar, for example. 
The painting is a good example of Caravaggio's use of tenebrism. An exaggerated form of chiaroscuro with sharp contrasts of dark and light. Caravaggio's style of tenebrism was hugely popular during the Baroque period and was used by artists from Rembrandt to Zurbaran. The calling of Saint Matthew focuses on a familiar theme for Caravaggio. That of the redemption of even the most sinful souls. What is a painted screen? In Japan, painted folding screens, called biobu, were popular in the imperial houses of the elite military rulers of the Momoyama period. While many of these castles and houses no longer exist, 17th century screens made by the Kano family remain. Compared to Western standards, 17th century Japanese houses were very empty. With no furniture or decorative trinkets filling interior spaces. Instead, movable screens were painted in bold colors. Often depicting nature, landscapes, and genre scenes. Painted screens by the Kano family include Cypress Tree. An eight-fold work attributed to Kano Itoku, 1543-1590, which was originally used as a sliding door. The artist emphasized the texture of the bark of the tree while simplifying the background, which serves to monumentalize the tree and evoke the vastness of nature. Who was Annabelle Karachi? The paintings of Annabelle Karachi, 1560-1609, were innovative for their naturalism. Broken brush strokes, and use of light. Karachi came from an artistic family, his older brother Agostino and his cousin, Ludovico, were also highly esteemed painters. Caracci was particularly inspired by northern Italian Renaissance masters such as Titian, Correggio and Tintoretto and he wanted to carry on a tradition of classically inspired painting. He studied in Rome, where he was impressed with the work of Michelangelo and Raphael. Like them, he went on to create masterfully illusionistic frescoes and ceiling paintings. In 1595 he was commissioned by Cardinal Odoardo Farnese to decorate the Farnese Palace in Rome. His work there is a Baroque masterpiece known as The Loves of the Gods, a cycle of ceiling frescoes. It took nearly 10 years to complete the paintings, which cover the barrel vaulted ceiling of the palazzo and feature monumental scenes depicting mythological gods and heroes. Karachi's work went on to inspire other great fresco artists, such as Pietro de Cortona, as well as other painters, including Pusa and Rubens. Who was Bernini? The art of Gian Lorenzo Bernini, 1598-1680, defines Baroque style. Bernini was primarily a sculptor, 
but he also worked as an architect, painter, and poet. His sculpture is exceptionally naturalistic, it lives, breathes, and occasionally screams with life. Bernini was a charismatic player in the upper echelons of Rome's high society who was famous by age 20. He was patronized by popes and aristocrats and was known for his cool confidence. Some of his highest profile commissions include the design for the Baldacchino, a bronze canopy in St. Peter's Basilica, and the Ecstasy of St. Teresa, a marble sculpture in Santa Maria della Vittoria in Rome. Bernini experienced a hiccup in his success when his part of the redesign for the Fagate of St. Peter's Cathedral proved a failure. But his design for the piazza is hailed as an architectural masterpiece. What is the Würzburg residence? The Würzburg residence is an important example of Rococo architecture in Germany designed by Johann Balthasar Neumann. 1687-1744, for the Prince Bishop of Würzburg, a member of the Schönborn family. The Kaisersaal, or Imperial Hall, of the residence has a gold, white, and pastel color scheme and emphasizes curves and elaborate ornamentation, including marble columns and undulating moldings. A grand staircase expands to over 600 square feet. Its balustrades and banisters decorated with statues and Greek vases. Above the sprawling stairs, the Italian Rococo artist Giovanni Tipolo painted what is believed to be the largest ceiling fresco in the world. It depicts the Prince Bishop with the Greek god Apollo, along with images of the seasons, the zodiac, and the four known continents of the world, all symbolizing the wide reaching power of the Sconborn family. What are the hallmarks of the Venetian Renaissance? During the Renaissance, the Republic of Venice was one of the most powerful city-states in Italy. Geographically and culturally removed from cities such as Rome and Florence, which were much further south, Art in Venice was greatly inspired by Northern Europe and the East, including Islamic and Persian styles from the Ottoman Empire, formerly the Byzantine Empire. The climate in Venice was also different from other Italian cities, as the city itself was mostly water. Venice is essentially a series of islands connected by canals. It was too humid for fresco painting. Venetian painters preferred to work in oil paint, using bold colors such as deep reds, blues, and golds inspired by the East. Venetian artists also continued to make intricate mosaics in the Byzantine style. And the city's architecture featured arches and domes more reminiscent of the East than the rest of Italy. What is the Venus of Urbino? Titian painted the Venus of Urbino for Guido Baldo della Rovera. The Duke of Urbino, 
in 1538. The painting is unabashedly erotic. Depicting a nude woman reclining on a disheveled white sheet covering deep red cushions. Her long, red hair sweeps around her neck and her hand rests gently along her hips. Only partially covering her sex. She stares teasingly from within the frame, a tiny dog curled near her feet. In the background of the painting, two women appear to be rifling through a chest, collecting clothing. There is no question, Titian has created a goddess. The provocative painting, part of a long tradition of female nudes in the history of art. Influenced artists even hundreds of years later. Manet's similarly bold, Olympia, 1863, would not exist without the Venus of Urbino. What is Rococo? Rococo is a distinctive style of art, architecture, literature, music and more, popular during the 18th century in Europe. The name comes from French, and is a blend of the word stones and shells. Both popular items in 18th century gardens. Like many other terms such as Gothic and Baroque, the term was created much later and used to disparagingly describe what 19th century critics considered the gaudy, bad taste of the 18th century. Rococo architecture is highly ornate, and characterized by curving. Rather than rigid forms, pastel colors, and an element of fantasy or whimsy. Painting also features pastel colors and witty, frivolous scenes of aristocratic lovers and mythological figures. Though there are occasionally cynical undertones in some Rococo paintings. For example in the prints and paintings of William Hogarth. Rococo first developed as a cohesive style in Paris and is specifically associated with the French King Louis XV and the rise of the bourgeois, or upper middle class. As with other categories of art, regional differences lead to variation of Rococo style. Important Rococo painters include Jean Antoine Watteau. Jean Honor Fragonard, and Johann Balthasar Newman, among others. Who is Titian? Titian is the nickname of Tiziano Vecalio, who started his career as Jurgens. Assistant and went on to become the official painter to the Republic of Venice. Titian essentially picked up where Jurgen left off after his early death and worked on a number of paintings attributed by some to Jurgen. Titian was a highly regarded painter during his long life and was even praised by Charles V. The Holy Roman Emperor who wanted only Titian to paint his portrait. Titian worked in oil, and was known to finely grind his pigments, and apply many layers of glaze to the surface of his canvas. As a result, Titian's paintings are nearly unparalleled in their vibrancy and color. What is the Church of Tugasu?
built in the late 16th century by Giacomo della Porta. The church of I. L. Gisù has what is considered to be the first Baroque facade in architecture. The church was built in Rome for the order of the Jesuits. Its plan was similar to the traditional cruciform basilica plan, with a long nave and aisles. It was topped with a cupola, a small dome. More shocking at the time was the church's exterior. The fagate is divided into two stories and blends Roman, Greek, and Renaissance architectural motifs such as doubled pilasters, engaged columns, arched pediments, triangular pediments. Niches, windows, Corinthian capitals, and large, scrolling volutes. Despite the many disparate elements, the church fagate is not overwhelming or chaotic. Patterns emerge to create a rich, unified space. The ornamental fagate of the Church of I. L. Gisu greatly inspired the elaborate architecture of the Baroque period. How did Korean art change during the Choson period? The Joseon dynasty lasted in Korea from 1392 until 1910, when Japan annexed the country. During this very long period, Korean art was heavily influenced by Chinese art styles and ideas. But a specifically Korean, often secular, style of art slowly developed. For example, the artist, Kim Hongdu, 1745 c. 1814, was known for his lively genre paintings that captured a sense of daily life in 18th and early 19th century Korea. His paintings often depicted people engaging in normal activities such as studying at school or sports activities like wrestling. He is known for a painting called Schoolroom, c. 1814, which shows a young student bursting into tears when he doesn't understand his lesson. The schoolmaster, wearing a rectangular hat and a beard, looks distracted and unsure of how to proceed with the lesson. What is Fragonard's The Swing? Jean Honor Fragonard's, 1732-1806, Erotic Painting The Swing, 1756, is an example of a boudoir painting. So called because its intimate subject was meant for private viewing. Fragonard accepted the commission to paint the swing, after another artist. Gabriel Frango Estoyan, declined to take on the project. The painting depicts a lush, expansive garden scene. At its center is a young woman wearing a flowing pink frock. Her apparent lover, a man in a grey suit wearing a white powdered wig reclines below her while a cleric pushes her on a swing. The lady is shown rising just above the aristocrat, giving him a salacious view under her dress, shocking nearby cherubs. Her delicate, pink shoe pops off her pointed toe, in apparent acquiescence. 
The painting is famous for its radiant colors and sensual themes. And is another good example of the Rococo style. What is Fragonard's The Swing? Jean Honor Fragonard's, 1732-1806, erotic painting The Swing, 1756, is an example of a boudoir painting. So called because its intimate subject was meant for private viewing. Fragonard accepted the commission to paint The Swing, after another artist. Gabriel Frango Estoyen, declined to take on the project. The painting depicts a lush, expansive garden scene. At its center is a young woman wearing a flowing pink frock. Her apparent lover, a man in a grey suit wearing a white powdered wig, reclines below her while a cleric pushes her on a swing. The lady is shown rising just above the aristocrat, giving him a salacious view under her dress, shocking nearby cherubs. Her delicate, pink shoe pops off her pointed toe, in apparent acquiescence. The painting is famous for its radiant colors and sensual themes. And is another good example of the Rococo style. What is chinoiserie? The word chinoiserie comes from French and roughly translates to Chinese-esque. As European explorers reached increasingly distant locations across the globe during the 17th and 18th centuries, Europe became more and more exposed to diverse art and culture. Chinese art was particularly popular during the 19th century. And the wealthy collected Chinese porcelain, sculpture, and other decorative arts. European artists eventually began to incorporate Chinese design elements into their own decorative arts. In 1762, a 10-story Chinese-style pagoda was built in Kew Gardens in London and serves as an example of the both the Rococo aesthetic and Western interest in Asian style. What is Chinoiserie? The word chinoiserie comes from French and roughly translates to Chinese-esque. As European explorers reached increasingly distant locations across the globe during the 17th and 18th centuries, Europe became more and more exposed to diverse art and culture. Chinese art was particularly popular during the 19th century. And the wealthy collected Chinese porcelain, sculpture, and other decorative arts. European artists eventually began to incorporate Chinese design elements into their own decorative arts. In 1762, a 10 story Chinese style pagoda was built in Kew Gardens in London. and serves as an example of the both the Rococo aesthetic and Western interest in Asian style. Why is time smoking a picture?
The work of William Hogarth, 1697-1764, is a good example of Rococo's more satirical side. The English Hogarth, a painter and engraver, ran in literary circles that included his friend Henry Fielding. His work frequently contains clear moral messages and biting social commentary. For example, his series of paintings, titled Marriage Alone Mode, 1743-1745, satirizes arranged marriages and cautions against vanity, betrayal, and vices such as drinking and gambling. Hogarth's etching, Time Smoking a Picture, also communicates a very specific message from the artist. At the center is an aging personification of time, complete with wings and a scythe, time's attributes. He sits glumly in front of a large framed canvas, shoulders hunched. Blowing smoke directly onto the painting with a long, thin pipe. The nude time sits upon a piece of broken sculpture. And his large scythe has fallen forward, slicing a hole in the painting. Next to him is a large jar of varnish. An inscription in Greek is written across the painting's frame. It reads, Time is not a clever craftsman, for he makes everything more obscure. In printed text just below the figure of time, another message reads, as statues molder into worth. And finally, a caption at the very bottom of the print says, To nature and yourself appeal slash nor learn of others what to feel. Hogarth is commenting on a common 18th century practice of using varnish and smoke to make contemporary works of art look older, and therefore more expensive. As older works of art were deemed more valuable than new ones. Time smoking a picture powerfully communicates Hogarth's criticism of the fact that art dealers were willing to destroy works of art to make a profit. Why is time smoking a picture? The work of William Hogarth, 1697-1764, is a good example of Rococo's more satirical side. The English Hogarth, a painter and engraver ran in literary circles that included his friend Henry Fielding. His work frequently contains clear moral messages and biting social commentary. For example, his series of paintings, titled Marriage Alone Mode, 1743-1745, satirizes arranged marriages and cautions against vanity, betrayal, and vices such as drinking and gambling. Hogarth's etching, Time Smoking a Picture, also communicates a very specific message from the artist. At the center is an aging personification of time, complete with wings and a scythe, time's attributes. He sits glumly in front of a large framed canvas, shoulders hunched blowing smoke directly onto the painting with a long, thin pipe. The nude time sits upon a piece of broken sculpture. And his large scythe has fallen forward, slicing a hole in the painting. Next to him is a large jar of varnish. An inscription in Greek is written across the painting's frame. It reads, Time is not a clever craftsman, 
for he makes everything more obscure. In printed text just below the figure of time, another message reads, as statues molder into worth. And finally, a caption at the very bottom of the print says, To nature and yourself appeal slash nor learn of others what to feel. Hogarth is commenting on a common 18th century practice of using varnish and smoke to make contemporary works of art look older, and therefore more expensive. As older works of art were deemed more valuable than new ones. Time smoking a picture powerfully communicates Hogarth's criticism of the fact that art dealers were willing to destroy works of art to make a profit. Who were some of the major portrait painters of the 18th century? Rosalba Carriera 1675 to 1757 A leading portrait painter in Venice known for her early miniatures and use of pastels. During a trip to Paris she made a pastel portrait of King Louis XV. She was accepted to the Academy of Saint Luke in Rome. As well as the French Royal Academy of Painting and Sculpture. Frangois Boucher, 1703 to 1770, French Rococo painter whose fashionable paintings of mythological and amorous scenes exhibited graceful style and shimmering colors. He was known for his stylish portraits of wealthy clients, including Madame de Pompadour, the mistress of King Louis XV. Joshua Reynolds, 1723-1792, English painter who studied in Rome and is known for his neoclassical style and monumental. Full-size portraits that effectively capture the essence of the sitter. Extremely well regarded, Reynolds was sophisticated in his approach to art theory. Thomas Gainsborough 1727 to 1788, highly honored, English portrait painter who also painted landscapes. Arrival of Reynolds, his work is infused with elegance and elements of nature. His work is sometimes considered to exhibit romantic tendencies. His delicate brushwork is evident in his portrait of Mrs. Richard Brinsley Sheridan. 1785, Elizabeth Vigilobra, 1755 to 1842, perhaps the most important female painter in the 18th century. She painted many portraits of Marie Antoinette and the French royal family while working in the Palace of Versailles. Her work strongly reflects the Rococo aesthetic. John Singleton Copley, 1738-1815, a resident of the colonial city of Boston and of Irish descent. He painted portraits of famous early Americans, including Paul Revere and Samuel Adams. Though in 1774 he expatriated to England at the behest of Joshua Reynolds and fellow expatriate artist Benjamin West. Gilbert Stewart. 1755 to 1828, leading American portrait painter, still famous for his portrait of George Washington. He also completed portraits of other significant American leaders such as Thomas Jefferson and James Monroe. His style greatly influenced other American painters of the day.
who were some of the major portrait painters of the 18th century. Rosalba Carriera, 1675-1757 a leading portrait painter in Venice known for her early miniatures and use of pastels. During a trip to Paris she made a pastel portrait of King Louis XV. She was accepted to the Academy of Saint Luke in Rome. As well as the French Royal Academy of Painting and Sculpture. Frangois Boucher 1703 to 1770, French Rococo painter whose fashionable paintings of mythological and amorous scenes exhibited graceful style and shimmering colors. He was known for his stylish portraits of wealthy clients, including Madame de Pompadour, the mistress of King Louis XV. Joshua Reynolds. 1723 to 1792, English painter who studied in Rome and is known for his neoclassical style and monumental full-size portraits that effectively capture the essence of the sitter. Extremely well regarded, Reynolds was sophisticated in his approach to art theory. Thomas Gainsborough, 1727 to 1788 highly honored, English portrait painter who also painted landscapes. Arrival of Reynolds, his work is infused with elegance and elements of nature. His work is sometimes considered to exhibit romantic tendencies. His delicate brushwork is evident in his portrait of Mrs. Richard Brinsley Sheridan. 1785, Elizabeth Vigilerbra, 1755 to 1842, perhaps the most important female painter in the 18th century. She painted many portraits of Marie Antoinette and the French royal family while working in the Palace of Versailles. Her work strongly reflects the Rococo aesthetic. John Singleton Copley, 1738-1815, a resident of the colonial city of Boston and of Irish descent. He painted portraits of famous early Americans, including Paul Revere and Samuel Adams. Though in 1774 he expatriated to England at the behest of Joshua Reynolds and fellow expatriate artist Benjamin West. Gilbert Stewart. 1755 to 1828, leading American portrait painter, still famous for his portrait of George Washington. He also completed portraits of other significant American leaders such as Thomas Jefferson and James Monroe. His style greatly influenced other American painters of the day. What is Mughal art? The Mughals were Muslim leaders descended from Genghis Khan who ruled over the Indian subcontinent from 1526 to 1857. In fact, the word Mughal means descended from the Mongols. At its peak, the Mughal Empire stretched from India to Afghanistan. The classical Mughal period is associated with the rule of Akbar the Great, ruled 1556-1605. During this time, the arts flourished and there was relative peace throughout the empire. Akbar the Great was supportive of grand architectural projects and was particularly fond of European etchings brought to him by Christian missionaries. 
his son and successor, Jahangir, supported royal workshops where artists produced immaculate illuminated manuscripts and miniatures paintings. What is Mughal art? The Mughals were Muslim leaders descended from Genghis Khan who ruled over the Indian subcontinent from 1526 to 1857. In fact, the word Mughal means descended from the Mongols. At its peak, the Mughal Empire stretched from India to Afghanistan. The classical Mughal period is associated with the rule of Akbar the Great, ruled 1556-1605. During this time, the arts flourished and there was relative peace throughout the empire. Akbar the Great was supportive of grand architectural projects and was particularly fond of European etchings brought to him by Christian missionaries. His son and successor, Jahangir, supported royal workshops where artists produced immaculate illuminated manuscripts and miniatures paintings. What is the Akbar Nama? The Akbar Nama, c. 1569 to 1590, was a series of 116 miniature paintings that document the life and successes of Akbar the Great. The Akbar Nama is known for its exceptional detail and realism. Multiple artists worked to produce the work. Akbar the Great commissioned his friend Abul Fasil, 1551-1602, to write the biography. For the ruler's personal copy, the painter Baswan was charged with designing and drawing the illustrations while Shatar Muni then provided the coloring. Folio 22 of the Akbar Nama, now part of the collection at the Victoria and Albert Museum. Vividly depicts Akbar riding Hawaii, a wild elephant. Chasing a second enormous, out-of-control elephant as it stampedes across a pontoon bridge. The image is filled with bold colors and details that add drama to the story. The water is textured so as to appear disturbed by the thrashing of the boatman knocked into it by the charging elephant. According to the story, Akbar was able to come and capture the elephant and the image. Stands as a metaphor for Akbar's ability to rule a large and often difficult empire. What is the Akbar Nama? The Akbar Nama, c. 1569 to 1590, was a series of 116 miniature paintings that document the life and successes of Akbar the Great. The Akbar Nama is known for its exceptional detail and realism. Multiple artists worked to produce the work. Akbar the Great commissioned his friend Abul Fasil, 1551 to 1602, to write the biography. For the ruler's personal copy, the painter Baswan was charged with designing and drawing the illustrations while Shatar Muni then provided the coloring. 
Folio 22 of the Akbarnama, now part of the collection at the Victoria and Albert Museum. Vividly depicts Akbar riding Hawaii, a wild elephant. Chasing a second enormous, out of control elephant as it stampedes across a pontoon bridge. The image is filled with bold colors and details that add drama to the story. The water is textured so as to appear disturbed by the thrashing of the boatman knocked into it by the charging elephant. According to the story, Akbar was able to come and capture the elephant and the image. Stands as a metaphor for Akbar's ability to rule a large and often difficult empire. What are Rajput paintings? Rajasthan, in northern India, was not part of the Mughal Empire's vast territory. Instead, it was controlled by Hindu Rajput rulers. Painting traditions in Rajasthan were influenced by Persian and Mughal miniature painting traditions and popular subject matter included images of Hindu gods, such as Krishna, and were often romantic and erotic. In Krishna and Radha in a pavilion, see 1760, the Hindu god Krishna, commonly represented with blue skin, is caressing his lover. Radha, while a yellow bolt of lightning overhead symbolizes their sexual attraction. What are Rajput paintings? Rajasthan, in northern India, was not part of the Mughal Empire's vast territory. Instead, it was controlled by Hindu Rajput rulers. Painting traditions in Rajasthan were influenced by Persian and Mughal miniature painting traditions and popular subject matter included images of Hindu gods, such as Krishna, and were often romantic and erotic. In Krishna and Radha in a pavilion, see 1760, the Hindu god Krishna, commonly represented with blue skin, is caressing his lover. Radha, while a yellow bolt of lightning overhead symbolizes their sexual attraction. Who was by Chedra? Bhai Chitra was an important court painter active during the reign of Akbar the Great's son. Jahangir, who ruled from 1605 to 1627, as well as Shah Jahan, who built the Taj Mahal. Bhai Chitra was a skilled miniature painter who was possibly raised by the court. Which is where he got his early education. He was interested in European painting and some of his work blends Indian landscapes with European perspective techniques. In his miniature painting, Jahangir preferring a Sufi to kings, see 1625, by Chitra included a small self-portrait among a group of other portraits of important figures such as Ottoman rulers and even King James I of England, which by Chitra likely copied from another portrait. 
The self-portrait shows the artist holding a small painting of himself. Resulting in a painting within a painting. By Chitra bows respectfully to Jahangir, the Mughal ruler. Who was by Chitra? Bai Chitra was an important court painter active during the reign of Akbar the Great's son. Jahangir, who ruled from 1605 to 1627, as well as Shah Jahan, who built the Taj Mahal. Bai Chitra was a skilled miniature painter who was possibly raised by the court. Which is where he got his early education. He was interested in European painting and some of his work. Blends Indian landscapes with European perspective techniques. In his miniature painting, Jahangir preferring a Sufi to kings, see. 1625, by Chitra included a small self-portrait among a group of other portraits of important figures such as Ottoman rulers and even King James I of England, which by Chitra likely copied from another portrait. The self-portrait shows the artist holding a small painting of himself, resulting in a painting within a painting. By Chitra bows respectfully to Jahangir, the Mughal ruler. What is the Taj Mahal? The Taj Mahal, in Agra, India, is one of the most recognizable structures around the world. With its white onion-shaped domes, arched windows, and long reflective pool. The Taj Mahal is made of marble, inlaid with colorful stones in a floral pattern. And also decorated with calligraphy inscriptions from the Churan. It is not a palace, but a mausoleum built by the 17th century Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan. Grandson of Akbar the Great, for his third wife, Mumtaz Mahal. Monumental tombs were part of an Islamic tradition and the design. Of the Taj Mahal mirrors the design of garden pavilions in Iran. It evokes a sense of calm and serenity through its symmetrical and balanced forms. And expansive pools and tall minarets. The building is symbolically linked to descriptions of gardens in paradise. From the Quran and is considered a masterpiece of Indo-Islamic architecture. What is the Taj Mahal? The Taj Mahal, in Agra, India, is one of the most recognizable structures around the world. With its white onion-shaped domes, arched windows, and long reflective pool. The Taj Mahal is made of marble, inlaid with colorful stones in a floral pattern and also decorated with calligraphy inscriptions from the Churan. It is not a palace, but a mausoleum built by the 17th century Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan. Grandson of Akbar the Great, for his third wife, Mumtaz Mahal.
Monumental tombs were part of an Islamic tradition and the design of the Taj Mahal mirrors the design of garden pavilions in Iran. It evokes a sense of calm and serenity through its symmetrical and balanced forms and expansive pools and tall minarets. The building is symbolically linked to descriptions of gardens in paradise. From the Quran and is considered a masterpiece of Indo-Islamic architecture. What is neoclassical art? Sometimes it feels like classical influence never goes away, but in the 18th century, a fully formed classical revival evolved on the heels of the Baroque period. During the 18th century, artists and aristocrats flocked to Rome to see the formidable Roman ruins and the art of the Renaissance. Also at this time, new archaeological discoveries were being made in Greece, revealing more about ancient Greek society and art, and fueling increased interest in classical ideas and aesthetics. The neoclassical style contrasted quite sharply with the flamboyant styles of Rococo and instead emphasized grand simplicity and stability as well as the noble, heroic ideal. Renewed interest in classical thought inspired more than art and architecture it also fueled political shifts and philosophical ideas that resulted in dramatic societal changes such as the French and American revolutions and the rise of Napoleon. What is neoclassical art? Sometimes it feels like classical influence never goes away, but in the 18th century, a fully formed classical revival evolved on the heels of the Baroque period. During the 18th century, artists and aristocrats flocked to Rome to see the formidable Roman ruins and the art of the Renaissance. Also at this time, new archaeological discoveries were being made in Greece revealing more about ancient Greek society and art, and fueling increased interest in classical ideas and aesthetics. The neoclassical style contrasted quite sharply with the flamboyant styles of Rococo, and instead emphasized grand simplicity and stability as well as the noble, heroic ideal. Renewed interest in classical thought inspired more than art and architecture it also fueled political shifts and philosophical ideas that resulted in dramatic societal changes, such as the French and American revolutions and the rise of Napoleon. What was Joshua Reynolds' grand manner? Joshua Reynolds, 1723-1792, was determined to elevate the status of British painting to that of the great masters of the Renaissance. And one of the ways in which he did this was to infuse his portraits with the grandeur and heroic idealism of the highest form of painting at the time, history painting. In his series of lectures, 15 Discourses on Art, 
Reynolds promoted the idea that contemporary British painters should paint in the great style of the old masters. His enormous, full-length portraits, such as Portrait of Jane Fleming, Countess of Harrington. 1778, and Lady Sarah Bunbury sacrificing to the graces, 1765, incorporate classical elements such as sculpture, vases, and architectural elements into the background to give his paintings an element of antiquity. In the latter portrait, Lady Bunbury is depicted as a Roman priestess. With her long Roman dress banded at the waist and pinned to the shoulder. As Lady Bunbury makes an offering to the Three Graces. Her friend Lady Susan Fox Strangways kneels beside her. Reynolds has elevated this aristocratic portrait to a symbolic, meaningful painting that inspires reflection on female friendship and beauty. What was Joshua Reynolds' grand manner? Joshua Reynolds, 1723-1792, was determined to elevate the status of British painting to that of the great masters of the Renaissance. And one of the ways in which he did this was to infuse his portraits with the grandeur and heroic idealism of the highest form of painting at the time, history painting. In his series of lectures, 15 Discourses on Art, Reynolds promoted the idea that contemporary British painters should paint in the great style of the old masters. His enormous, full-length portraits, such as Portrait of Jane Fleming, Countess of Harrington, 1778, and Lady Sarah Bunbury sacrificing to the graces, 1765, incorporate classical elements such as sculpture, vases, and architectural elements into the background to give his paintings an element of antiquity. In the latter portrait, Lady Bunbury is depicted as a Roman priestess. With her long Roman dress banded at the waist and pinned to the shoulder. As Lady Bunbury makes an offering to the Three Graces. Her friend Lady Susan Fox Strangways kneels beside her. Reynolds has elevated this aristocratic portrait to a symbolic. Meaningful painting that inspires reflection on female friendship and beauty. What is neoclassical architecture? Neoclassical architecture of the 18th century was a powerful reaction against the highly decorative styles of Rococo architecture, and emphasized logic, symmetry, and geometry in its design. Neoclassical architecture was particularly popular in the design of public buildings. And at least in Britain, private country homes. What is neoclassical architecture? Neoclassical architecture of the 18th century was a powerful reaction against the highly decorative styles of Rococo architecture, and emphasized logic, symmetry, and geometry in its design. 
neoclassical architecture was particularly popular in the design of public buildings. And at least in Britain, private country homes. How did the Reformation affect art during and after the 16th century? The Protestant Reformation had an enormous impact on all of Europe, forever changing the political power of the Catholic Church and shifting allegiances among European countries according to religion. The Reformation began in 1517 when Martin Luther published his 95 Theses. A declaration of protest against the Catholic Church. Specifically with regards to the Church's selling of indulgences, and questioned the authority of the Pope. Luther even mentions the Pope's extravagant spending on the new St. Peter's Basilica project as a point of contention. Martin Luther was excommunicated by the Pope. But those who shared his feelings vowed to break away from the Church, resulting in violence that lasted decades. Those Christians who broke away from the Catholic Church were called Protestants. During the 16th century, Europe was divided among countries that supported Catholicism and those that supported the Protestants. The Catholic countries included Italy, Spain, France, Flanders, and Belgium. The Protestant countries were England, Switzerland, Germany, and the Northern Netherlands. Protestant artists and patrons approached art differently than their Catholic counterparts. In Protestant countries, religious subjects were less in demand and most patrons were wealthy individuals who favored portraits. Scenes depicting moral proverbs, still lives, and eventually landscapes. In response to the Reformation, the Catholic Church launched the Counter-Reformation in an effort to revive Catholic faith. Catholic patrons commissioned Christian art that emphasized reverence of the Trinity and of the Virgin Mary, as well as demonstrated restraint in the use of nudity and pagan subject matter. When did printmaking begin? By the 16th century, printing technology, such as the woodcut, had been around for hundreds of years, first developing in China in the 5th century. Printmaking was first used to apply patterns to textiles, and then later was used on paper. Intaglio processes, such as engraving and etching, developed in Germany in the middle of the 15th century. Evolved from techniques used by goldsmiths and jewelers. Printmaking allowed artists to make multiple copies of a text or an image and mass production of prints began in the 16th century, forever changing the consumption of art images and texts. Who was by Cheddar? Vychitra was an important court painter active during the reign of Akbar the Great's son. Jahangir, who ruled from 1605 to 1627, as well as Shah Jahan, who built the Taj Mahal. 
Bai Chitra was a skilled miniature painter who was possibly raised by the court. Which is where he got his early education. He was interested in European painting and some of his work. Blends Indian landscapes with European perspective techniques. In his miniature painting, Jahangir preferring a Sufi to kings, see. 1625, Bai Chitra included a small self-portrait among a group of other portraits of important figures such as Ottoman rulers and even King James I of England, which Bai Chitra likely copied from another portrait. The self-portrait shows the artist holding a small painting of himself, resulting in a painting within a painting. Bai Chitra bows respectfully to Jahangir, the Mughal ruler. What are Rajput paintings? Rajasthan, in northern India, was not part of the Mughal Empire's vast territory. Instead, it was controlled by Hindu Rajput rulers. Painting traditions in Rajasthan were influenced by Persian and Mughal miniature painting traditions and popular subject matter included images of Hindu gods, such as Krishna, and were often romantic and erotic. In Krishna and Radha in a pavilion, see 1760, the Hindu god Krishna, commonly represented with blue skin, is caressing his lover. Radha, while a yellow bolt of lightning overhead symbolizes their sexual attraction. Why is time smoking a picture? The work of William Hogarth, 1697-1764, is a good example of Rococo's more satirical side. The English Hogarth, a painter and engraver, ran in literary circles that included his friend Henry Fielding. His work frequently contains clear moral messages and biting social commentary. For example, his series of paintings, titled Marriage Alone Mode, 1743-1745, satirizes arranged marriages and cautions against vanity, betrayal, and vices such as drinking and gambling. Hogarth's etching, Time Smoking a Picture, also communicates a very specific message from the artist. At the center is an aging personification of time, complete with wings and a scythe, time's attributes. He sits glumly in front of a large framed canvas, shoulders hunched. Blowing smoke directly onto the painting with a long, thin pipe. The new time sits upon a piece of broken sculpture and his large scythe has fallen forward, slicing a hole in the painting. Next to him is a large jar of varnish. An inscription in Greek is written across the painting's frame. It reads, Time is not a clever craftsman, for he makes everything more obscure. In printed text just below the figure of time, Another message reads, as statues molder into worth. And finally, a caption at the very bottom of the print says, To nature and yourself appeal slash nor learn of others what to feel.
Hogarth is commenting on a common 18th century practice of using varnish and smoke to make contemporary works of art look older, and therefore more expensive. As older works of art were deemed more valuable than new ones. Time smoking a picture powerfully communicates Hogarth's criticism of the fact that art dealers were willing to destroy works of art to make a profit. What is Fragonard's The Swing? Jean Honor Fragonard's, 1732-1806, Erotic Painting The Swing, 1756, is an example of a boudoir painting. So called because its intimate subject was meant for private viewing. Fragonard accepted the commission to paint the swing, after another artist. Gabriel Frango Estoyan, declined to take on the project. The painting depicts a lush, expansive garden scene. At its center is a young woman wearing a flowing pink frock. Her apparent lover, a man in a grey suit wearing a white powdered wig, reclines below her while a cleric pushes her on a swing. The lady is shown rising just above the aristocrat, giving him a salacious view under her dress, shocking nearby cherubs. Her delicate, pink shoe pops off her pointed toe, in apparent acquiescence. The painting is famous for its radiant colors and sensual themes. And is another good example of the Rococo style. Who was Bronzino? Bronzino was the nickname of Florentine artist Agnolo di Cosimo. 1503-1572, who studied under Pontormo, a fellow Mannerist painter. Bronzino's most significant patron was the Medici family. For whom he completed many projects, including altar pieces and frescoes. Today. His portraits are among his most well-known paintings, particularly his portrait of a young man. Painted in the 1530s, and now in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. The identity of the young portrait sitter is unknown. But he is likely a friend of Bronzino's who ran in the same literary circles, Bronzino also wrote poetry. The sitter holds his finger gingerly between the pages of a book, eliciting curiosity about its contents. The well-dressed young man is poised. With good posture and an air of confidence that is only belied by his slightly crossed eyes. He seems to be fully aware of his own superficial airs. He is as much of a mask as the faces carved into the side of the ornate table. This is Bronzino's skill the artist has an ability to purposefully pose his sitter for the viewer. To make us aware that we can only see the cover, and not the contents of the book. What is Vanita's painting? Vanita's paintings were popular in Dutch and Spanish, still life painting during the 17th century. 
they are symbolic of beauty, material luxury, and the brevity of life. In Harman Stenix 1640 an allegory of the vanities of human life. The artist depicts a tabletop covered with a jumble of trinkets and various objects. Illuminated by a powerful beam of light entering into the frame from the upper left. The items on the table include a skull, oil lamp, musical instruments, a watch, a sword, a seashell, and books. Luxury items such as the sword and the exotic shell represent wealth and material possessions, other items such as the skull, oil lamp, and timepiece, serve as a memento mori, or a reminder of death. Other common symbols found in Vanitas paintings include candles, flowers, exotic fruit, and hourglasses. What is neoclassical architecture? Neoclassical architecture of the 18th century was a powerful reaction against the highly decorative styles of Rococo architecture, and emphasized logic, symmetry, and geometry in its design. Neoclassical architecture was particularly popular in the design of public buildings. And at least in Britain, private country homes. What is chinoiserie? The word chinoiserie comes from French and roughly translates to Chinese-esque. As European explorers reached increasingly distant locations across the globe during the 17th and 18th centuries, Europe became more and more exposed to diverse art and culture. Chinese art was particularly popular during the 19th century. And the wealthy collected Chinese porcelain, sculpture, and other decorative arts. European artists eventually began to incorporate Chinese design elements into their own decorative arts. In 1762, a 10-story Chinese-style pagoda was built in Kew Gardens in London. And serves as an example of the both the Rococo aesthetic and Western interest in Asian style. <laughs>